Okay, are we on? Can you hear me? Hey, this is Dave Malkoff reporting from the International Space Station, 240 miles above the Earth. Well, not exactly. We are in Houston. This is the trainer that astronauts use before they head to the ISS. But how do you live outside of the Earth's atmosphere? You bring the atmosphere with you. Inside this room, inside the atmosphere, the Earth provides us with breathable air, pressure, heat, protection from radiation, disposal of carbon dioxide. On orbit, there's, there's only vacuum. vacuum. We see a suit in a good config. We just wanted to uh, verify that we didn't have any leaks there. The space program brings human life to a place where human life is impossible. All right, thanks a lot. This is what they call the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. It is the closest you can get to the outside of the International Space Station here on Earth. They do it underwater so you can kind of get that floating action you would get in zero gravity. But how do you get the entire space station in one building? Well, you chop it into pieces and you drop it in the largest pool on the planet. This is 40 feet deep. It's 6.2 million gallons. Look, here come the astronauts now. So we'll go through those motions. Okay. Dr. Serena Onan is an American astronaut. Dr. David St. Jock is Canadian. Before they head to the International Space Station, they train in the tank. All right, see you there. NASA's dive team is on standby just in case they need rescue. Sure there's something else, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. The time has come for Dr. Onan to put on a real spacesuit. That's good, you got it. The spacesuit itself is like a tiny spaceship. It's not easy to put on. There we go. Yeah, one by one, each section is sealed up tight. Yeah, that's good. So ED2 has crew lock bag number two. Copy, you have a go to translate to the spare pump module on ELC-1. The International Space Station duplicated here underwater is a remarkable achievement. An orbital science lab built by humans who breathe air, existing in the blackness where there is none. Seen here in an exclusive 360 degree virtual reality tour, we are about to take you inside the earthbound replica of the International Space Station, not far from NASA's mission control in Houston. So what are these different nodes? So th this is Japanese here, down here? Uh, correct. Scan your screen to step inside. While the pool trains astronauts for working outside the station in spacesuits, the stack, as they call it, gets astronauts ready for the inside, where you can wear a t-shirt. You're in charge of creating the weather here. Essentially, yes, yes. So how do you create the weather on a space station that's, what, 200 miles above the Earth? That's correct. We have to essentially bring the weather with us. And so the things we tend to take for granted simply on Earth of the air moving things around, helping cool our bodies, even the oxygen that we're breathing around us, we have to create all of those in place for the astronauts to have that safe, habitable environment. It's a very comfortable uh, 72 degrees average room temperature. I am uh, Tracy Caldwell Dyson. I've been an astronaut since 1998. We tracked her down in Houston. This astronaut has been up to the space station on a shuttle. Liftoff of Space Shuttle Endeavor. And on a Russian Soyuz rocket. That's Tracy taking off there. The first stage lasts about two minutes, same as the shuttle. Tracy and engineer Jason Dake are exactly the kinds of experts that can explain to us just how the heck they do that. How they fill a space station with air you can breathe. There's an atmosphere provided for us that uh, makes us feel right at home. So let's talk about the oxygen. Where does that come from? We can uh, simply launch oxygen up and have that available to the vehicle. Has cleared the tower. But launching a rocket isn't easy or cheap. Without oxygen, the space station would have a very bad day. That is why there is an amazing second way to create an artificial atmosphere. 
there's also a system that can generate oxygen from water. Is that also a fuel cell to provide a little bit of power? In this case, it's not. It's a similar technology to fuel cells, though. In space, everything runs in a loop. Machines turn water into oxygen simply by removing the H from H2O. So as I breathe out, there's carbon dioxide coming out of me and the mice back there that we saw, too. We don't have the benefit of the Earth's atmosphere simply moving those away from us. And so for carbon dioxide, uh, we have a system uh, that specifically targets that. We have an oxygen generating system, and we have a CO2 removal system. When an astronaut breathes out, that breath eventually passes through something called a CEDRA, carbon dioxide removal assembly. You see, on Earth, we have trees to do this. Up here, not too many trees. The Cedra uses beds of silica gel, kind of like those packs that you get with a new pair of shoes, and zeolite, a material on Earth used in kitty litter. That's how they pull carbon dioxide out of the air. The CO2 is compressed, hydrogen is added from another system, and eventually you have water to drink, oxygen to breathe, and waste gas to dump out into space. It takes a team of people on the ground to run that and monitor it. There was that one time under close supervision where Tracy Caldwell Dyson shut the carbon scrubbers down as an experiment. Several hours had gone by and the CO2 levels had, had really increased and I started to notice a, a headache. It was two and a half times above normal. Her crewmates started getting headaches too and Tracy quickly tried to reconnect the scrubbers. And I was getting so aggravated at it that um, I could feel myself. And knowing, knowing that was one of my symptoms is to be agitated, um, I could actually, I was actually um, cognizant of the fact that I was um, experiencing uh, high CO2 levels for myself. And so I was so grateful when I got that thing on there and cranked up the carbon dioxide removal assembly and started to breathe fresh air again. <laughs> Here in the tranquility note of the space station to your right with the moon, that thing that looks like an outhouse, well, it's exactly that. The world's most expensive, exclusive bathroom. Here's astronaut Sonny Williams. And this guy right here is for number one. When Sonny drinks water, it all gets flushed down that tube. What's flushed spins around in the distillation assembly to separate water from waste. You see, urine is mostly water, and this machine can recover 85% of it. It's pumped into another tank where it's cleaned, filtered, destinkified, and sent back into the station for use. In microgravity, number two is a little more complicated, so it just gets thrown out. Sometimes things get a little out of control if you are out of control yourself flying around, so we have lots of protective stuff. And of course, you do have your privacy. There's a little door. It's very, very cool just to be in here. Speaking of microgravity, that's the one thing you just don't get when you're walking around in here on your two feet. That is on the other side of the room. There is basically one spot on Earth where NASA can simulate zero gravity. You want to take a ride? In the first 15 or 20 minutes that someone's in it for the first time, it's just body flailing everywhere. This is quite a sensation. It's so weird because you, you, don't, you don't realize which way you're going. Right now, I weigh about two times what I would normally weigh, but right when we get over that hump, whoa, this is what you would feel if you were on the surface of Mars. Woo! That was me back in 2004 aboard a commercial zero gravity flight taking big dives in the sky to simulate microgravity. Skittles, anyone? Woo! Astronauts used to do this. They used to call it the vomit comet for good reason. You're gonna step through this strap. This is our robotic anti-gravity room. We're about ready here to lift you up off the table. There's no, there's no more Vomit Comet. Uh, no, right now we're not using the, the Vomit Comet, the C9 plane here at NASA. I am going to give you a safety tether. Hey, you. my dog has a safety you tether. You might recognize yeah. it. Today's astronauts. This is quite a sensation. Use the Active Response Gravity Offload System, or 
Argos. They always are tethered to the structure. Beneath me, a scale model of the space station. Wow. So you'll hear the alarm sounding right there. Oh, you're that, at about don't go too fast. 2.8 feet per second. So right now you're already going faster than the astronauts are trained to go when they're uh, doing their EVAs. Doing EVAs or spacewalks are obviously a little bit different than the anti-grav simulator. For example, <laughs> not wearing the right gear. Oh, that's right above my nose. Oh, yeah, wow. it's it's a tight fit. Wow. There you go. I thought you'd have some room in here. Oh, wow. Look at that. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, astronauts have to learn the basics. It does start to spin me. Yep. With no atmosphere, there's no friction to slow you down. Essentially, Argos is a large robot. Yet nothing on Earth gets spacewalking quite right. So what exactly does a spacesuit do for you? Let's say an astronaut were to leave the station without a suit, naked. Well, gases would expand inside his body. His blood would feel like it's boiling with all that bubbling. Never mind the whole suffocating and freezing to death bit. Good job. Ah, oh my goodness. That's much more difficult than I thought it would be. Wow. I heard my audio turn on. This isn't at NASA. No, no. This isn't even in Texas. <laughs> You're in Delaware, believe it or not. A spacesuit factory called ILC Dover has been building these things since the old days. It's not a suit, it's a little spaceship. It is. It's a space. It's your personal spaceship, size to you. I'm Lindsay Aitchison. I'm one of our senior spacesuit engineers here at Johnson Space Center. NASA buys the ILC suits, some prototypes they build themselves, and tests them long before they have to work in space. Inside your spacesuit, it's 100% oxygen. Spacewalk suits, the ones they have on the station, operate at a very low air pressure about one third the pressure we have here on Earth. Oh, I felt it. I felt a pressure change. You know what? like a plane coming right, down exactly. just by putting on the glove. Low pressure makes it easier to move your hands. Just think how hard it would be to move inside a fully inflated balloon. So when you put your arms in here, go ahead and put your hands all the way in. So what you're feeling is the same pressure as what would be inside of your spacesuit outside of space station right now. Spacesuits help an astronaut breathe. They cool the astronaut with 300 feet of water tubes running underneath it all. The suit's layered design even stops many shooting stars called micrometeoroids. So small, they're like the size of dust motes. <sighs> but they're going 17,000 miles an hour. Exactly, yeah. so they're pretty dangerous. It's a rather cumbersome suit and it's large. Astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson knows it well. Her suit also protected her from the harsh sun high above the atmosphere. It was beaming right onto my face. And yes, I could definitely feel that. In fact, I was worried I might get a sunburn. There it is. Oh, I got sunglasses. Mirror sunglasses. Those are, that is gold. That is real gold. Tracy's low pressure spacewalking suit would not work very well on the moon or Mars. She has to put it on in an airlock. Whereas with this design, our rear entry suits, it's very novel in that you can open up this rear hatch. Oh, look at that. And so you would open this hatch, and then as an astronaut, you would slide your feet in and then slide all the way into the spacesuit to make it very easy to take on and off. Just slip inside and go for a Mars walk. This is about as close as you can get to the inside of the International Space Station under Earth's gravity. The only way to get to the real thing is to rocket up on a Russian Soyuz. That's about to change. What future astronauts will be riding in and what they will be wearing next. Two, one, zero, and liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. America will continue the dream. That was 2011, the last flight of America's iconic space shuttle program. I saw one once. It's amazing. You can really feel the power of the boosters rumbling through your body. You can also feel a real sense of American pride. Today, this is the only way Americans can get into space in a tiny Russian capsule called a Soyuz. It is really cramped in there. However, the future may bring human spaceflight back to the USA. 
That dragon flew in December of 2010. That's it why it has the re-entry marks on it. That's correct. Two and a half times uh, around the Earth and then back into the Pacific Ocean. The next place we need to bring Earth's atmosphere to lift off of the Falcon 9. is another planet. Falcon 9 is clear the tower. The SpaceX Dragon is already flying to the ISS. Company founder Elon Musk now says we may need something a little bigger to get to another planet. Musk and his second in command Gwen Shotwell want to be the first to help people breathe somewhere out there. Beyond low Earth orbit, beyond the moon, and certainly to Mars. But Gwen Shotwell, Elon Musk, and everybody over at SpaceX has some competition from aerospace giant Boeing. This is their own spaceship. It's called the Starliner, and this is their direct competition with SpaceX. They not only have this spaceship to get up there, but they've also got their own space suit. This one is worn inside the spacecraft in case there is some kind of failure with the life support systems, but it's lighter. The helmet actually zippers on, and you can use these gloves for the first time on a touch screen, any kind of tablet or phone inside the spaceship. Wow, you've got a lot of people working here, and a lot of passionate people too, I would guess. SpaceX has more than 5,000 employees working to make humans an interplanetary species. I have the best employees on the planet. Well, <laughs> and off the planet. Soon to be, guess. possibly soon to yeah. be off the planet. That's correct. <laughs> Boeing has more than 144,000 employees worldwide working on a number of projects, obviously not just space. But these are two private companies fighting to build Earth's first true interplanetary vehicle with seats on the inside. Here inside the massive Building 9 at Johnson Space Center, engineers have their own ideas. NASA's Orion spacecraft has only flown once. That was just a test flight. Its real goal is to take people and the atmosphere around them beyond low Earth orbit to places like an asteroid, maybe even Mars. I want to show you something here in Node 3, the section of the space station just past the bathroom everybody always asks about. This section is known as the cupola. At night, when everyone goes to bed and uh, you're so inclined, you can nestle myself inside the cupola. It's really remarkable. It's a series of thick glass windows all around you that connect astronauts in t-shirts to the vacuum of space. In a moment, one of the most touching emotional stories you'll ever hear directly from an American hero. Some of the most meaningful moments for me during my mission. My name is Tracy Caldwell Dyson. Been an astronaut since 1998. At night, when everyone goes to bed and you can nestle yourself in there and just watch it go over the Earth for an entire orbit. And that was um, some of the most meaningful moments for me. I just couldn't believe that I was where I was. There's nothing here that could ever, ever replicate that view. It's real. You're not looking at a movie screen. You're not trying to imagine it in 3D because it is in 3D. The sun is moving and you're moving. It casts these amazing shadows and it creates light that you only get a glimpse of here. Then when there's storms, it's amazing to see how fast an electron moves. The stars aren't twinkling when you're above the atmosphere. You don't have that. Also, you, when you look long enough, you start to actually see the depth between stars. And, and to know that your eye is detecting the difference in light years between stars, and it's, that blows your mind away. There's still nothing that um, captures what I saw. Just so calmly nestled there in your shirt sleeve and wondering how in the world did you get this opportunity to do this? You're in awe of what it took to even build this thing that you are so comfortably resting in. And then you start to think about all of the people who came together to make this happen. All the people who are down in mission control right now, all across the world. The minute fraction of, of the human population that has ever seen that. Uh, you, you just, no one 
no single person deserves that. So. <laughs> What does it teach you about humanity itself when you look down on the earth like that? Oh, um, not to judge, but I just, I can't imagine anybody that was um, looking out that window could have so little regard for this planet. It does look a little fragile. And then you look out in the blackness of space and how it goes on for infinity. You're like, how does this exist right here? This is special. You look at the Earth and you don't see countries. You just see Earth. I would hope that anybody going up there to see our planet from that viewpoint would um, feel a little bit of that and bring it back with them. We're all striving to make space accessible to more than just NASA and its astronauts. So I believe more people will see this, this gift that we've been given. That fraction that gets to see it is gonna grow. I believe so. I hope so.